having just been told by Marty Wolf that the truth is overrated, Jason Shepard leaps through the window of his homeroom classroom, hoping not to be counted tardy by the teacher. The teacher who almost catches him in the act says, Jason Shepard, you little demon, did you just hop through that window? Now, it's one thing, I suppose, to be called a little demon, the devil's little helper. It's another thing entirely, is it not to be called the devil himself? You're filled with the devil is one thing. You are filling the role of the devil is another. Can you imagine being identified as evil incarnate? Being named with the name that is below every name, so to speak, Satan. Not a little sneak who's trying to get out of trouble, but the big cheat who is trying and desiring that everyone fall into trouble. The Asp of Eden, the old wily foe, the prince of this world, the father of big, fat lies, so to speak. Now I suppose if I were to call you one of those names, it might sting a little, right? But what if the one who so identified you as the one whose name is above every name? The one you identify as the shepherd of Israel, the chosen of God, the anointed, the Christ, the Messiah, God in human flesh. What if he called you the devil? I don't know what hurts more than sting, (laughs) but that would be it, wouldn't it? In identifying Jesus as the Christ, Peter uses a term that means anointed one, the chosen of God, and therefore a gift to God's people. In calling Peter Satan, Jesus uses a term that means the accuser, the adversary of God, and thus the foe of God's people. Now, there's no denying that in a perusal of the text, we're in Mark, the ninth chapter. We're going, uh, we're going through, uh, excuse me, Mark, um, uh, the Mark, the eighth chapter. We're going through Mark this Lenten season. You heard Vicar John read it earlier. We'll look at starting about verse 27, if you have your Bible. Now, Peter begins the whole affair or excuse me, Jesus begins the whole affair. And I I don't doubt that Peter thought it was maybe a little bit unfair. Jesus asked the question, the end of verse 27, rolling into verse 28, who do people say that I am? And the answer is given. Some say that you are Elijah or one of the prophets, maybe one that had preceded him like Moses, maybe one that had followed him like Malachi. Some say that you are John the Baptist, a guy from an earlier chapter in this very book. What about you? Who do you say that I am? Peter's quick to respond. You are the Christ, the son of God. Ding, ding, ding. Bingo, way to go. Jackpot, you hit it. In Christ, Peter knew that God was in his people's midst once again. And therefore, I assume that he kind of thought things were going to be good once again. And then things turned very bad for Simon. Jesus had asked the question, who do people say that I am? Peter had correctly identified uh, who he wasn't, Elijah, Moses, John the Baptist, and who he was, Christ, the Son of God. And I'd bet at that moment, some pride began to penetrate Peter's perception. And I'm willing to wager that a small smile stretched across the Savior's face. Peter was correct. Jesus 
is the Christ. He confirmed verbally, publicly, what the 12 had only talked about privately. You do know who he is, don't you? Jesus, the anointed, the Christ of God. Now Mark, the text we're reading this Lenten season, stays silent on what I think is probably a fairly important matter, as does the Gospel of Luke for that matter. Now, Mark is, in my estimation, Peter's gospel. Uh, in other words, I believe that Mark, the author of these words, is scribing Peter's story. Uh, Mark is listed, or in fact, uh, cast in stained glass in our narthex, but not here in the nave. See, Mark's not numbered among the 12. He's not one of the original disciples, so to speak. He's not one of those that Jesus uh, has said, come follow me, that original cast of disciples. He's a companion who later on will craft these words. It's my contention, not just for this sermon, that Mark is Peter's gospel. Peter. The one people will come to know as, as the rock. Good old Saint Pete. His own story in Mark does not include an important matter. A commendation that Peter receives after saying these words. You're familiar with it. It's only recorded in Matthew's gospel, but it's so well known, I bet you could fill in the blanks. Peter has just said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, well done, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven, you're on a roll, you got it, you know it, right? <laughs> Blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail or overcome it. Right? That's some good stuff right there, right? Simon has just said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you. Flesh and blood hasn't told you this, but my Father in heaven has revealed it to you, and you are Peter, Petros, a pebble. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I tell you what, if I am Peter, I guarantee you it's making it into my gospel. <laughs> you can look hard. There is no verse for that. You have to go to Matthew to find it. Mark leaves out this really important point, at least in my opinion. Now Luke, in his gospel, doesn't record those words, but he also doesn't record the, co the, the, com the condemnation that comes later on. Uh, he avoided the commendation that we know from Matthew, and he also avoids the condemnation that we hear in Mark. Get behind me, Satan! You have in mind the things of men, not of God. Matthew covers it all. Mark, Peter's own gospel. Peter's gospel, if my contention is correct, only discusses the pain, not the praise. Having just identified Jesus for who he is, the Christ of God. God. Having been given a new name himself, Petros, we know from Matthew's gospel. Having just heard that the gates of hell will not prevail over this truth. In a 180 degree head spinning moment, Peter goes from solid stone to sly Satan. Uh, he goes from blessed to cursed. One whose message that the gates of hell will not prevail over to one who is actually an agent of Hades himself. Get behind me, Satan. What is it that causes that moment? 
What is it that makes us go from, from that joyous situation to this painful O occasion? Well, Jesus says the words, don't tell anyone about this. For the son of man must be betrayed by the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the teachers of the law, and killed. And Peter pulls Jesus aside and begins to rebuke him. Peter doesn't merely seek clarification. Excuse me, Jesus. I, I thought I heard you say something about being killed by the church. Surely that's not what you meant. He, he doesn't offer humble correction. I know the weight of being the Messiah is pretty darn big, Jesus. But surely God's master plan cannot be for a martyred Messiah. Can it, Master? No, Peter skips over clarification, plows through humble correction, and goes headfirst into condemnation, a rebuke. Notice he doesn't even at this point offer uh, to be the bodyguard. Hey, don't worry about it, Jesus. I'll lay down my life to protect yours. He'll do that later on. Here and now, Peter throws down the gauntlet. This is not gonna happen. It's not how it's going down. This shall not take place. Peter demands the very thing that Satan had merely offered last week. The thing we heard Pastor Kyle preach about last Sunday or Vicar John preach about last Wednesday. That the kingdom might want to go a different direction. Maybe you can get to a the throne without going through the thorns. Maybe you can have a crown without a cross, Jesus. Uh, how about praise, void of pain? It's all one and the same. Satan's offer and Peter's demand. So Jesus rebukes Peter. And it comes with clarification and correction. Peter, you are not thinking the way God thinks. You have in mind the things of men. You haven't grasped what the Spirit is really doing here. You're thinking about what you want, not what I know that you need. You're fixated on why you believe I'm here rather than why I've already told you I'm here. The very thing you're gonna have Mark record in the fourth chapter of your own story. Well, Jesus didn't say that, but you know, he could have according to my contention. And in fact, in the fourth chapter of his story, Mark does record the words, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, there remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Peter, Peter in the writing of his gospel avoids the glory and shares only the gory details of being called Satan. Leaves me wondering why. What does this mean? Well, the vicar who is a student at Concordia Seminary will tell you and correctly so, uh, that the seminary prophets will tell you, you cannot give a clear answer where the Bible is completely silent. I'm no longer a student. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you exactly what is going on here. It wasn't the fact that maybe the shame was greater than the applause. It was not because the haunting thought of being an agent of Hades was more powerful than the promise of being a part of that which the gates of Hades cannot overcome. It wasn't because his fellow disciples kept picking at his peccadillos, nor was it because Peter could not receive forgiveness for some reason deep down inside. He went on to feed Jesus' sheep. Why is it? It's so that he can connect to you the readers of his story so that you can connect 
to generations past. Peter would have Mark avoid the praise, only focus on the pain for you and for me, who at some time will be bound to travel the same path as Peter. For at some point in every disciple's journey, everyone who follows Jesus decides to become a backseat driver. Tell him where to go because he is headed the wrong direction. Sorry, Lord, this isn't supposed to happen is not a sentence that is petered out among God's people from the day it was first spoken here and recorded in Mark. You must be mistaken, Lord. This isn't how the story is supposed to end. Sorry to correct you, my sovereign, but nothing embarrassing, let alone harmful, ought come my way. God, get it right. Don't you know this isn't the way it's supposed to go down? Listen up, Lord, this should not happen. To my bride, to my children, to your bride, the church, to your children, Christendom. God, if you only knew what I know, you would go a different way. You know, Peter, for his part, he was only looking for Jesus to avoid suffering. And we got to commend that, right? I mean, he has that correct, right? Uh, Out of all the people who have ever uh, walked this planet, there's only one who should never have suffered at all. There is only one who should never have experienced any shame, let alone the sepulcher. And Peter just wants him to avoid it. And unwittingly, he ends up playing the role of the prince of this world, telling Jesus to take the kingdom a different direction. How much more painful is the folly of the followers who are telling Jesus that they shouldn't suffer when he himself has? See, I'm convinced that Peter's story Mark's gospel here, puts a corrective lens first on the church calendar. Two weeks ago, we heard Pastor Kyle preach about James and John and Peter going up on a high mountain with Jesus. That event takes place right after this event. That event takes place right after this event. Right after Jesus has said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter, he says, hey, take a walk with me up this hill, will you? Jesus doesn't leave Peter behind. He doesn't allow him to remain fallen. He raises him up and says, come walk with me and stand before me in all of my glory. Like Peter. We are connected to faithful generations past, followers who are full of folly themselves and simultaneously forgiven freely in Jesus, recipients of his full grace who can stand before him in all his glory. Peter, in recording his story, allows you to tell yours warts and all in the light of the Lord. That's why Peter records the events as he does, or why Mark writes them down if you prefer to go that direction. If you have ever hurled hellish accusations at God, if you've ever told him he doesn't know what he's doing and he needs to get a clue, if you've ever condemned, critiqued, or criticized, or complained about a direction, If you thought you knew better, and if only he knew what, rather than say, get behind me, Jesus allows the Father to turn his back on him, to condemn him in your place. And through that, the gates of hell are crushed. Nothing conquers it 
or overcomes it. For the times you, like Peter, for the times I, like Peter, whether accidentally or intentionally, have been a mouthpiece of the gates of hell, Christ himself goes to the cross. And today, Peter connects us to himself so that we can recognize that that we are free to call Jesus the anointed one of God because we have received the anointing of his grace and his mercy and been invited to walk beside him as we follow him through life. Pray with me. Gracious God, we confess that just like St. Peter, at times we have thought you don't know what you're thinking, let alone what you're doing. And perhaps far worse than the apostle, well, we've done so because we're the ones who want to avoid suffering. We thank you, Lord, that you have suffered for us. And that through such, you have conquered the grave. All the accuser holds against us, all the adversary would produce against us, vanquished in your death and your resurrection. And so now, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us to not only identify you as the anointed one who have received your anointing uh, in the body, in the small group, in the company of fellow disciples, but that commissioned, we might go into the world so that all might know who you are. In your name we pray, amen.